We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Welcome to another edition of Free Association Radio. This is Robert Phoenix, and today you are dialed into navigating the astrological matrix. And Wednesday's show is devoted to astrology and looking at events through an astrological prism. Sometimes I think reality is nothing more than an exercise in futility, which leads us ultimately towards awakening. And uh, hopefully today we will try to sort through some of the rubble and confusion that exists around this whole notion of the royal baby and get to some form of clarity as to what it all might mean for you and for me because there's a lot going on in the world right now besides the fact that there is a uh, supposedly royal royal child bearing royal blood and royal seed which popped out on uh, Monday. Monday's show was... Uh, Quite interesting, wasn't it? It's quite interesting. Uh, I got rolling on the show in about uh, 22 minutes or so, 23 minutes in, everything just went dead. I apologize for that. Apparently, they had a server issue here at Blog Talk Radio, and um, I don't know how they resolved it, but it did get resolved, and uh, unfortunately, it got resolved after my show was over. But anyway, we're here now, and we're here to discuss this royal child. Now, what's really fascinating is that if you follow my show or you follow some of the um, other, (coughs) excuse me, almonds, some of the other people that are out there trying to untangle what's going on, there are a number of uh, posts and stories emerging now that uh, this may not even be Kate's child. And there are a number of compelling stories and reasons as to why uh, this exists or why this might be the case. Now, what's fascinating is, is that if it's not Kate's child, then whose is it? And if it is still not Kate's child, then how did it come into being? And does the chart even really matter? Can we even trust the royal family to give us the right time? There's a lot of unknowing that goes along with this territory. It's a bread and circus. It's a it's a carnival. And potentially it's a part of the grand illusion. Of course, Monday was the day that we were supposed to have the double star of David. I talked a little bit about that. Um, that chart was put together by a Luis Vega and made quite the rounds on the Internet. And um, if you look at that chart, it was composed primarily uh, with sidereal astrology, using some fixed stars, but mostly sidereal astrology, 13 sign astrology. 
And uh, you can go on the internet if you haven't seen it and find that chart. Um, and it came to me as I was looking at that chart and looking at sidereal astrology. And sidereal astrology is different than Western mundane astrology. I always thought that thought the uh, the whole notion of the astrology in the West being named mundane was also interesting. Uh, but sidereal astrology is very close to Vedic astrology, and Western mundane was, of course, set by uh, Ptolemy, and when he was the uh, the oh, hold on a second, somebody keeps trying to get a hold of me. You know, I've got I have to close Facebook here. I apologize. Sometimes I have it open just because. And then I get that little. <laughs> anyway, Western astrology was uh, started by Ptolemy using uh, the precession of the equinoxes and Aries and the constellations. Zero degrees Aries, the first sign. This goes all the way back to Egypt. Sidereal astrology uh, is different, and uh, it is, again, much more in alignment with the um, constellations versus the signs, and is still used today with uh, the Vedic system. Now, when I looked at the sidereal chart, and was just contemplating what the meaning was for the sidereal chart. I noticed, of course, that one of the signs that Vega had included is uh, what's often called the 13th sign, and that would be Ophiuchus, and that rests between uh, Sagittarius and Scorpio. It's the serpent bearer, and Ophiuchus came to popularity about three years ago when when an astronomer, or he was actually a, a teacher of astronomy at a junior college in Minnesota, when he brought up this whole notion and concept and difference between Western mundane and uh, the the constellations and Ophiuchus and the inclusion of the 13th sign. People talk about this all the time. They've talked about it for, for years. Every now and then, an astronomer gets a bug up his ass or her ass and decides that they're going to throw a, a wrench into the astrological model. And then what happens is is that uh, people look at it and they they laugh at it and say, well, astrology is bogus bullshit, whatever you want to say. And then they kind of move on and it, gets, it goes away. However, three years ago when this came up, there was a serious amount of traction that took place. And I think it has to do with the Internet. The Internet is a very fertile bed for um, viral memes and programs. And since, since that came out, I believe it was talked about on Good Morning America even – uh, in some women's magazines, of course, if you want to popularize something, put it in a women's magazine. That's what Bernays figured out very early on. But uh, it's had some traction. So this chart for the 22nd included Ophiuchus, the 13th sign. Sometimes uh, Cetus is also used. Cetus is uh, the whale, and that would make it the 14th sign, but rarely uh, is it included. Some people do use it. Anyway. Uh, so we had the sidereal chart for the birth, or at least the sidereal chart for the day of the birth. And what occurred to me is, is that the sidereal chart and the sidere in sidereal astrology is probably much closer to the astrology of the quote-unquote elite or the bloodline families. And Western mundane astrology is given to us. So we have essentially two models of reality based on two separate types of uh, astrology, and maybe that's why the Indian or Vedic culture is venerated because it's the one that's closer to the bloodline astrology. So we have differing models and differing uh, even uh, manifestations of reality. However, we're going to be talking about today the Western mundane chart of this baby. Now, as I said before, when I opened the show. Uh, there's quite a bit going on in terms of trying to determine whether or not Kate even had a child. Now, one of the things that's interesting is if you look at the photo or, or the video clip that we see of her uh, recently, just recently, just what, yesterday, she doesn't even, this woman does not look like she had a child at all. There's no weight gain, there's no uh, added. Um, mass to the mammary glands for, for to be uh, to be able to you know uh, nurse the child. I mean, she looks like she just pretty much came out of the gym. Very strange stuff. And there's hardly any uh, pooch. And if there is a pooch, 
there's a very good chance that she could have been wearing some kind of a small little, uh, I don't know, what would you call it, prosthesis for her belly. They have these things that make, they, they, you can wear them. They have these things that make you look pregnant. Sometimes men wear them, believe it or not. Strange, I know. But sometimes men wear them to uh, feel like uh, how their wife may feel. They may add, even add some weight to the belly just to get a, a sense. So she did not look pregnant at all or even post-pregnant when we saw them the other day. Also, it's quite interesting. If you look at William's right hand, while he's holding the baby, he has his two uh, middle fingers together, and he has his pinky and his index finger apart from them. This is a classic hand sign uh, that the elite families use to uh, signify that they are indeed uh, elite and of high born. You can see this throughout uh, many paintings over time, whether it's Napoleon or even some of the uh, elite peerage from our culture, society, George Washington, of course, the royals, you'll see the two two fingers together and the two fingers apart. Go ahead, watch that video. You'll be able to see Prince William actually show that hand sign. So they have a baby there. If she didn't have the baby, then who had the baby? Well, one of the things that's taking place now is this whole concept of surrogacy. And surrogacy is the uh, ability for of a woman to have a child without bringing that child to term inside of herself. This is, uh, apparently this was started by Taylor Dane or popularized by Taylor Dane, the the B-list uh, pop star from the 1980s. And she wanted to have a child, but she also did not want to lose her spot on some Broadway show. So she hired a surrogate. Uh, the starting price for a surrogate is around $18,000 and the surrogate can bring the baby to, to term. And and the mother, it's using the mother's egg, believe it or not. Isn't that crazy? It's using the mother's egg. It's strange stuff. Very strange stuff. They're able to actually implant the egg and and with the sperm of the father or the donor into the surrogate, and the surrogate brings it to term. And it's just, it's just basically a, a hatching chamber. It's all it is. And so uh, this is not uncommon when it comes to um, Hollywood starlets or uh, singers, there's some uh, rumors that this is what happened with Beyonce, who rarely, if ever, looked pregnant. We know Kim Kardashian didn't have a surrogate. I think that's pretty certain. So there's a whole question or notion as to whether or not Kate actually had this child. But let's just say, for instance, the child was born, that this child is real. And the chart that we have is based on the time that we were given. There are certain things about this chart which are very, very interesting, and we can go over them. Uh, I'm looking at July 22nd, Monday, uh, 4.24 p.m. British Standard Time. That's London, UK, 51 North 30, 000 West 10. Those are the coordinates. And the thing that really jumps out at me you know, uh, charts are like a roar sock. <coughs> Excuse me, a, a blotter. And by the way, people who are waiting for readings, uh, 631, 631, I'll, uh, I'll get to you as soon as uh, I finish this. And then we, we can talk about um, the quote-unquote royal baby or get into some readings here. Um, but, the, but whenever I look at a chart, and I think most astrologers have this experience, they see the chart, it's like looking at a person for the first time. It's like a Rorschach. You see the blots, you know, it's like you get an impression. Or there's a person, boom, you get an instant impression. And hopefully all your biosensors are turned on and you're seeing, reading, and feeling that person uh, from top, uh, head to toe, inside and out. And hopefully with as little judgment, but with some discernment. That's how you kind of work the crowd. It's how you deal with people. It's how you figure them out. It's how you you know, feel out whether or not they are safe and safe, safe, safe and sane or, or dangerous. But anyway, the, uh, the chart gives you the first impression. And the first impressions I get are for this chart, the stack eighth house, uh, the true note in the 12th house. And of course the split, the opposition between the sun and the moon 
and Venus at zero degrees Virgo, which is conjunct Regulus, the star of royalty, up in the ninth house. So we can talk about some of these. There's the Grand Trine as well with Saturn and Neptune and Jupiter. Now, the Grand Trine would symbolize the fact that this is a person that has the potential for being a social reformer, especially with Saturn and Scorpio in the 11th house, but also uh, capable of great compassion. However, with Mars at seven, is it Mars is at six and Jupiter is at five degrees, uh, the aggression or the, uh, the active feeling modality is uh, favored more than the ability to uh, expand and uh, surrender and relax into a situation. Now, this is all very complicated in some ways because these planets are in the eighth house. I don't know if you've ever hung out with somebody who has eighth house planets, either an eighth house Venus or an eighth house Sun. They're very hard to get to know. You don't really get to know the people that have um, personal aspects in the eighth house. The transpersonal aspects, and by that I mean either Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto, are a bit of a different story altogether because those aspects are hitting that person um, at a very deep level, and they don't really have to do with their identity per se, although it does manifest uh, in their identity but from a, from a different place. It wells up and sort of, especially with Pluto, consumes the totality of their identity. One of the uh, famous uh, uh, Pluto 12th house characters I know in history is Bruce Lee. And Bruce Lee has, of course, a very intense um, uh, personification of life and death. Everything with Bruce Lee was in the moment and with an edge. So we can see that with Pluto uh, emanating in the 8th house. And, of course, people that have Pluto natally in the 8th house, they're scared to shit that they will die at some point. Well, we all die, but... Um, you know, Bruce Lee theoretically met some sort of strange, untimely, violent death. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, who uh, has the same birthday as Bruce Lee, also had Pluto in the eighth house as well. So Uranus in the eighth house that manifests in accidents, uh, things happening to you, things happen, you know, things bumping, things, you know, uh, getting clumped on the head, car accidents, strange events. Um, it's the subconscious trying to get that person to stay in touch with the subconscious as it relates to reality in general. And then Neptune in the eighth house uh, can often indicate some very deep form of addiction and dependency. Now, the baby royal, who's interesting enough, there was no name. You would think that after theoretically nine months of housing this child, whoever did it, whether it was Kate or their, her surrogate, that there would be a name already baked and ready to go. Now, we are in day two, and there is still no name, baby no name. So it's going to be hard to get to know who this person is. Who is he? What's he all about? His birth is shrouded in secrecy. The eighth house is the house of birth and sex and death. It's, it's all there. And yet we don't know who he is. We don't know in some ways where the origins and roots of his biology stem from, or even what his true identity is. And we see the opposition between the sun and the moon, and this is actually quite interesting. And it does not bode well. If you are a fan of royalty, if you are a fan of the court, the sun and the moon represent separation between the mother and the father in the chart. I can tell you a number of times I've read for people where the sun and the moon uh, in the uh, in a place of opposition in the chart represents, at the very least, a divorce, and in extreme cases, the death of one of the parents. Now, if we look back, and everything has been a model of uh, Charles and Diana, even with Kate wearing her updated version of the polka dot theme. Apparently, polka dots are very big this year and have some sort of transformational import. But we have the sun-moon opposition, and it's a... If we look at this in terms of the Diana uh, Kate theme as it's being played out, well, what are we looking at with the sun and the moon opposition? Well, Diana divorced Prince Charles, a rarity, a rarity in the royal bloodline, absolute rarity. 
would this opposition also represent a divorce, or perhaps it might even be a death? And if it is a death, would it be Kate's, or would it be William's? Based on the chart, I would say that likely it might be William. And as a result, this child would then become the King of England, either this child or possibly even the little brother, Harry, King Harry. And Harry is an interesting character in a lot of ways. Uh, Harry, it seems, has gone through uh, more of an initiation, at least outwardly, uh, than William has. Harry has a very strong connection with the United States. He spends a lot of time here other than William. And uh, the, he's been to some very interesting locales, shall we say, like the Yucatan in Mexico and South America and wandering through shamanic hotspots. But the sun-moon opposition does not bode well for Prince William in this chart because the sun is in the eighth house and the sun is the father in the eighth house is Dex death and sex and birth and rebirth and transformation. And it's at the 29th degree, the anoretic degree, the hardest degree in astrology, endings and beginnings. And then slightly, just slightly better at 28 degrees, there's the moon in Capricorn. Down, down, down in the second house, which is all about the foundation, the root chakra, and there's the mother. The mother is cold. The mother is distant. The mother, Moon and Capricorn, is a chilly, chilly place. Could even be a barren womb. But the Moon and Capricorn, there it is, uh, down in the second, and of course Uranus in the second as well. And if we look, let's just say, for instance, if we play with the seventh, uh, the, I'm sorry, the eighth and the second house axis, in the eighth house we go into the darkness. You know, we go into the bedroom. We go into the place where the lights are off. And where two bodies meet, and where two bodies congregate, and two spirits interpenetrate one another. This is where the act of procreation takes place. And the opposite is the light of day. It is the second house. It is the landing on earth. It is terra firma. It is the most basic and fundamental house. And what do we have there? Well, we have the mother, but she's in Capricorn, the moon in Capricorn. And then we have Uranus. I'm sorry, Pluto, my bad. That's Pluto. We have Pluto down in the uh, second house, which brings up a whole other series of uh, insights with Pluto opposite Mars. That's violence. That's, a, that's an extremely intensely violent aspect that this child will be, whoever this child is based on this birth time, rage, tantrums, very, very powerful, extremely powerful, pulling the seething, roiling energies of the eighth house down into the second house with Pluto in Capricorn. Uh, the amount of resources available to this child will be almost limitless with Pluto and Capricorn in the second house. But unfortunately, I think that they will be limitless solely as it relates to war because Again, Mars opposes Pluto. And you get into this oppositional axis where you're trying to work out these two very intense and dynamic energies, cardinal energies, initiatory energies. Pluto in the second house would also represent birth as well. But again, it's a detached kind of birth. It's a Capricornian distant sort of birth. So the whole concept and notion of a surrogate could actually be seen here, potentially, in the chart. Well, let's go over to the fifth house, and that's where we have the house of children. And what do we have there? We've got Uranus. Again, it's a highly unusual. It's, it's a planet where the mothering, the mothering aspects, the fathering aspects, the rearing of the child is very unusual. And what are we looking at as well? We're looking at a T-square between... Pluto and Uranus, and then, oh yes, that eighth house where there's Mars and Jupiter. So does this answer the question? Was Kate really the mother, or did she employ a surrogate? And if so, is this the child from the surrogate born on this very day? If this chart is any indication, then I would say the answer is quite likely yes. 
Now, does that mean it's Kate's child and Will's, and Will's child? Possibly. Possibly. You know, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. But what we do know is we know the chart. We know the chart. We know the time. The other aspect of this, which is jumping out at me, is that true node, true node in Scorpio in the 12th house, you will not know who this person is because their destiny is shrouded in secrecy. Their destiny, their life, their purpose, all shrouded in secrecy. And um, the 12th house, as it relates to Scorpio, is a very intense house. Trust me, I have it. I know it. So the access, and I'm saying access is A-C-C-E-S-S, -S, access to the 12th house, uh, is colored, I believe, by the sign that's there. Now, I've been talking about, ever since I started the show, I've been talking about the 12th house as the house of the soul. And I've noticed now that some other astrologers are starting to, to see it in that way. I'm not a groundbreaking astrologer in any way. I'm just noticing that other people are starting to talk about it like that. Because that's how I see it. The 12th house is not some, it's not, it's not a burdensome place that is symbolic of jails and insane asylums and all these other um institutions where people get lost <clears throat> because that's what the 12th house usually represents. You know, for me, the 12th house is more, is more like a, uh, it's like the cosmic ocean. It's like the void. And it's how we get in touch with our souls. It's how we get in touch with the essence of God and, and each house or sorry, each sign that is on the, uh, cusp of that house or rules that house, that's how we use the energy or how the energy uses us. So with Scorpio in the 12th house, that is a very shamanic, deeply underworld house that we get in touch, that this individual would get in touch with the soul through uh, encounters that were dark and intense in very underworld, uh, in their uh, intensity. Now, this is like the labyrinth. This is like the this is like navigating through nightmares and navigating through intense and perilous spiritual tests. And then, as you go through that, you begin to get to places that are more luminescent and transcendent because that's the energy of Scorpio. So this is what this individual has to do with their life. This is their life path. Their life path is not the path of the world. It is the path of other worlds or the other worlds to send into this individual so that they can have a place to dwell with Pluto and the moon in the second house. Um, when we look at, again, uh, first first, second, third, fourth. I'm sorry, Uranus was in the fourth house, not the fifth house. I, I'm using a chart that I, it's not, it's not my chart. I don't usually use the software. So everything's just slightly off. So going back to Uranus in the fourth house, clearly that's even more of an indicator that uh, Kate likely, based on this chart, likely used a surrogate. That's what I'm putting out there. Um, and then we have in the third house, Neptune and Chiron. Now, this, this person will also be quite psychic. And I, I think at times will suffer from uh, illness but recover very quickly because of that robust Mars-Jupiter conjunction in the eighth house. Very sensitive with Chiron in Pisces in the third house in extreme sensitivity. And of course, Neptune is playing with Jupiter and, and Saturn in that grand trine. There is a chance, whoever this baby is or wherever it came from, there is a chance of redemption here with the grand trine. At some point, probably uh, when Saturn is in the sign of Pisces, that the individual will have a very strong uh, awakening. And it will, remain, it will remain to be seen 
what kind of a waking it will have. So that's about, let's see, uh, two and a half, uh, it's five at the age of eight when Saturn crosses Neptune. That's a very profound time. Um, that might actually be the time when William might exit this world with Saturn crossing Neptune. Okay, so now we go to Venus at the top of the chart. And Venus is in Virgo at zero degrees. Now, Venus in Virgo is in its fall. It's not a great place for Venus. It's at zero degrees. It's the most intense, the most potentiated degree of Virgo. Um, some of the aspects are this chart are they're not great. The sun at 29 degrees Cancer is in the opposition of the moon at 28 Capricorn. Not great. Venus and Virgo, not great. And Venus pretty much stands up there uh, alone for the most part. And it is again, attached to Regulus. Now, Venus will be the, the one area where he will have the most uh, import and influence into the world. And it's through relationship. Relationships will be difficult for him and Venus and Virgo, very very picky, very selective. But the other thing with Virgo, we have to look at Virgo, and Virgo is a is a sign that is connected to perfection or connected to some form of, uh, at, at the very least, manageable order. If you've ever been around somebody who's Virgo rising, they need to have the world around them neatly ordered. Maybe not in their house, but certainly uh, in their environment, in what they do, in their schedules, and it's all very ordered. Now, of all the signs in the zodiac, I think there are two that probably come the closest in their own way to representing what I would call the perfect ideal or eugenics, and that would be Virgo and Aquarius. Aquarius because it takes place in the laboratory. Virgo because it has the ideal. It's the perfected state. It's the virgin. It is pure. It is white. Uh, and it is, it is uh, unpolluted. That's what Virgo is. And so when we have Venus and Virgo at zero degrees, in the ninth house, which is the house of ideology and the house of teaching. And planets, when they show up in the ninth house, it, uh, it, people that have those planets, they can be often very very zealous in terms of how they express that ninth house energy. So the relationship here, here with Venus and Virgo is one with the intent to find some kind of purity in the world. Unattainable purity, by the way through relationship and through its association with other countries and cultures. So this will be quite interesting to see how this uh, manifests over time. Um, and there's more, there's, there's, there's plenty more to this chart, but these are the, these are the touch points that I'm looking at. And he's got a lot of quintiles in this chart, too, by the way. He's got a quintile between uh, Neptune and the sun. And that will help bring out the personality. Uh, it will be somebody who, on the surface, looks placid and very composed and peaceful. But underneath, there's a whole other reality going on with this individual. And, and very psychic as well with Mercury uh, in Cancer in the eighth house. All right. So there we go. That's my 30 minute riff, 30 minute plus riff on the Royal baby and who or what might be going on with this baby. There's, there's plenty more of what happened on that day. Uh, and since that, that, uh, that happened, there's been a few things in the world. We had a crash in, New York with a Southwest Airlines plane didn't have a landing gear. Landing gear fell out and just dropped. And of course, now we have a major fire going on uh, just off the coast of Louisiana again. And this is a gas derrick, a platform that is that caught on fire last night. And I don't know where we are today with it, but this is just two days, and we have this uh, massive 
gash in the earth and literally the flames of hell escaping uh, into our atmosphere here in this country and uh, to the people potentially in South America and the Caribbean. This is part of a larger experience, part of a, uh, a meta ritual where we open the veins of hell and release the energies and the spirits and the fires within. I don't know, but it's happening right now. And uh, is it going to be as bad as BP? We'll see. This is a gas fire. They're very difficult to put out. Very, very difficult to put out. And if it blows, then we have some real issues. Because that area has been hacked and fracked quite a bit. And uh, they have those uh, salt domes down there. And those salt domes are literally little mountains. Everything is part of a large ecosystem. And the salt domes are part of a small mountain range. Uh, well, not small, a fairly good-sized mountain range at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, it's a living, breathing organism, just like everything else. And if you begin to um, penetrate and uh, threaten its integrity, well, then we've got we've got problems. The New Madrid Fault, or the New Madrid is how we pronounce it here, um, that is connected to the lattice work of salt domes and everything else in the Gulf of Mexico, we are being led from crisis to crisis here in this country and abroad for a number of reasons, uh, most of which are to distract us, but also to sap us of our energy, our focus, our concentration. And it's manifesting in personal lives. How many people do you know right now that are going nuts? Raise your hand. If you know, if you don't know somebody in your life, who isn't losing their shit, you're living in a monastery. That's how I see it. And the destabilization of reality on a daily basis does not lend itself to any kind of emotional consistency and coherence, as John Trudell would say. And it's all heating up, all heating up. And the the uh, flashpoint for me is November. That is the flashpoint. Although I think August could be very interesting as well. Okay, let's uh, let's jump in here. Let's start taking some phone calls. Let's go to the six three one line and see what they have to say. Hey, Hello. how you guys doing today? Hello. Hello. Hey, how you guys doing today? I'm uh, good. Who's this? My name is Don. Hey, Don. What's up? Oh, nothing much. Uh... Yeah, I agree with you. It's actually absolutely insane out there right now in this whole world, in this country. It's, it's an absolute mess. So what are you doing to keep your feet on the ground and not fall into the pit of madness? Hey, man, I'm just working, doing what I can do. I work for myself. I run my own business. I just keep my uh, myself focused and uh, try to go straight and really can keep all the outside static away from me. Yeah. Uh, are you in a relationship? Ah uh, yes. And how do you how do you maintain the sanity uh, in your relationship? Because I think relationships are taking big hits right now with people. There's absolutely zero sanity in it. <laughs> There's zero sanity forever in it. So, so craziness just, comes with the territory. Okay with it then. I'm sorry. You just surrendered to it, and you're okay with it then. That's yeah. That's all you can do. Yeah. Every, okay. Everybody's crazy. It's just what crazy can you deal with? Right. Right. I would agree with that. What crazy can, what degree of crazy can you check in on and deal with? So do you exactly. want to look at your chart today, Don? I'm sorry? Would you like me to look at your chart? Yeah, definitely. All right. Let's fire it up here. And what part of the world are you calling from? Back east somewhere? Yep, New York, exactly. All right. A lot of good friends in the New York area. Um, let's see, let's go into the chart section, and go. let's go right, go on You're going to be replacing LeBron James' chart. You're replacing what, I'm sorry? LeBron James, I have to, I have to eliminate some charts here, so you're taking this. <laughs> uh, when is your birthday, Don? September 11th. Okay, 9/11. That's a that's an interesting day. 
1968. Okay. So you're a monkey? I believe, yeah, yeah. Yep. And what time were you born? Uh, it was like, I think like three something in the morning. Three something in the morning. Yeah, I All forget right. exact time, but it was definitely at three o'clock in the morning. Three o'clock in the morning. Okay, let's start with three o'clock. Uh, what is, where, where was that? Queens, New York. Queens, New York. Okay. There it is. All right, so without knowing your exact uh, rising sign time, we're sort of uh, we're, we're playing with about three quarters of a deck here, but uh, and we could do some rectification, uh, but for the for the purpose of time and space, let's just look at your chart and see what's see what's happening. Um, let's see, you've got uh, Sun and Virgo, Moon and Taurus. It's a very wide trine, ten degree, nine degree trine. Which is good. I mean, that bodes well in terms of balancing, staying balanced. Moon and Taurus is is the rock of Gibraltar, and uh, it brings a nice balance and ballast uh, to the Sun and Virgo. So you can be detail oriented. You can have uh, an idea as to you know what you want to do and how you want to get there. And uh, the Moon and Taurus uh, hopefully allows you to get there in style from time to time. Uh, you have the you have the potential to make good money, Don. Uh, with Jupiter conjunct your sun, uh, anytime. So when we get into Virgo, Virgo is one of those signs where hard work is actually rewarded. Not all signs are rewarded by hard work. Some signs have to work uh, maybe softer or more intuitively, or maybe they work in spurts. Like uh, people who have Gemini tend to work better in spurts. They'll have bursts of uh, activity and then they'll stop and they'll pick it back up again. But Virgo and Capricorn, uh, those are the two signs. That seem to be rewarded by actually working hard. And if you put your uh, energy into whatever it is uh, that you're doing in your life and you do it consistently, uh, you will reap benefits and rewards from your commitment because you have Jupiter and Sun trining the moon. So we're talking earth science here. We're talking material, material goods, assets, um, anything that you do also along those lines where you can uh, help people or bring some sense of well-being or stepping outside of yourself uh, to assist others uh, will also uh, pay off for you. It may not uh, pay off for you directly uh, in terms of money, but it will certainly pay off for you in terms of uh, feeling good and feeling like you're actually you know, doing your life work. And when that happens, you get rewarded in different kinds of ways. Now, ideally, what would be great is if you could bring those two together, you could be in a profession where you're helping people and you're serving people, but also doing it in a way where you can uh, you can benefit from it. Sometimes that's uh, in the medical industry, or you know, uh, an interesting way of doing that would be doing stuff like making prosthetic limbs for people, like uh, some you know, where you can actually help someone and uh, and then also you know uh, profit from it. Any any kind of work that you do and put your nose to the grindstone, um, you'll do well. You also have uh, Sun conjunct Pluto and Sun conjunct Uranus, which means you have a, a stellium in Virgo. Jupiter, Sun, Pluto, Uranus, four signs. Anytime you get past three signs, you have a stellium. So you're very Virgoan and you're very, very transformational, especially with that Pluto uh, conjuncting your Sun. The leader of the pack is Uranus, which means that uh, the whole uh, sort of train of your momentum and swing in your life, whatever you do should be led by unconventionality and doing things outside the box. Um, you actually have a potential of being a very creative and innovative thinker and problem solver. And when you, when you look at something, the first thing that you would look at is how can I fix this? How can I change this? And the types of ideas and the types of inspirations that would come to you would be very novel, very unique. And then if we go, if we really go and, and just work that stellium, the next planet after that is Pluto. So you would have the idea, you would have the insight, you would have the epiphany, and then Pluto comes in and says, okay, this is how it will change things. Now you put the energy of Pluto into it and, and begins to, to take on a, a life of its own. And it's powered by the sun and it's powered by your identity because it means something to you and you want to accomplish something. And then guess what? You've got Jupiter on the back end of that, which is financial reward. 
So what you want to do is you want to let your, um, your novelty, your inventive nature, your ability to think and see outside the box guide you through life always. If you do that and problem solve from uh, an alternative or outside uh, perspective, you will be rewarded. Whatever you do, whatever you do. And this can also have some application to your personal life as well. You're an intense guy. And uh, being, I would say being in a relationship with you uh, could be both really interesting, dynamic, fascinating, but also challenging. Because when we get all that Virgo together, there's a lot of nervous energy. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you run that nervous energy. You stay in shape, watch your body, watch your health. Don't become too obsessed because that's what Virgo can do, especially with Sun conjunct Pluto. Um, you're, you, in terms of your own nature, uh, you have Venus uh, in, in Libra. You have Mercury in Libra. They're conjunct. That's wonderful. That's a really good aspect for being empathetic with other people, bringing win-win into other people's lives. Also, the Venus-Mercury conjunction is quite good for sales. And because with sales, you want to be able to kind of model and empathize with other people and allow them to feel safe and comfortable. And with that aspect, it's, it's, uh, it's quite good for that. Also, in terms of relationship, um, you have the ability to understand what your partner is feeling and to be able to articulate uh, those feelings. What you don't want to do is you don't want to get trapped in uh, process mode. You don't have a lot of water in your chart. The first water that shows up is Neptune and Scorpio. And uh, it's actually the only water planet in the chart. So people that are lacking in water, sometimes they'll overcompensate and they'll be with people who can be overly emotional. So there's a, there's a fine line between being with somebody who can bring emotion into your life and, find, and, and, and one where it goes just you know, the cup runneth over and maybe it's a bit too much. So that's a, that, that is something you need to be able to kind of work out both uh, – externally as it relates to partnership and relationship, but also uh, internally as well. How do you stay fluid? How do you stay uh, attached to some kind of a emotional signal um, that works for you? Because the challenge with without a lot of water in the chart would be for you to intellectualize your emotions all the time. And um, while you can empathize with people with the Venus-Mercury conjunction, it's from a mental perspective. If you bring the water into it, then not only do you have the the mental perspective, but you also have the, the emotional content. You've got Mars and Leo, very dynamic, very passionate. Uh, again, let your, in, let your inspiration be your guide with that Mars and Leo. Very, very creative. Uh, it trines uh, Saturn in your chart. So you have the ability, again, once you get fired up about something, to see things through and work on it with the Saturn-Mars trine. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, transits, your true note is at Aries at nine degrees. So Uranus uh, right now is dancing on your true note and will be uh, throughout the rest of this year. It's to uh, nine degrees in November, and I believe it begins to move forward uh, in November, but it does hit nine degrees. And your true note is like it's supposed to be, you know, it's, it's the aspect of, you know, who you are. It's your beacon. It's your true north. And when you have it in Aries, it's, it's, it, it represents – somebody who's here to understand who they are, to find themselves, to take risks, to be a pioneer. It opposes a Venus and Mercury in your chart, which would be at odds sometimes with relationships. But you must understand who you are. You must find out who you are, and you'll, and you'll take the appropriate steps to do that and to keep pushing yourself in ways that you are um, – uh, experiencing the broadening of your horizons in this world. Now, Uranus is on your uh, on your true note, which means that there's a shift for you, and there's more of a sense of unconventionality and doing things differently, even looking differently at times, taking some chances with you know how you appear, <clears throat> but also being very open to the uh, uh, energies of of invention. It's a very powerful time for you in terms of you know receiving. Uh, you know, images or dreams or, the, you know, the light bulb going off over your head, the aha moment, I've got it, right? So this is going to be going off for you through November. It moves uh, past your true node uh, in uh, December and certainly the 2014, and it's moving on. So what you want to do is you want to, you want to it's like a lightning rod. You know, between now and the end of the year, you want to just grab hold of that lightning rod and ground it and get as much 
kind of um, electricity and inspiration and um, inventiveness in your life. You know, study people like Tesla, uh, Wilhelm Reich, get a, get a feel for really outside eccentric maverick inventors who were able to, you know, have like ideas or blueprints come to the whole because that's really kind of the energy that you're playing with in your life in general, but also more so now than any other time. So I think that this, I think you're in a good space. Now you're going to have this T-square, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in um, coming up in uh, November uh, with uh, Pluto and Uranus, Uranus again being on your true node, Pluto uh, in uh, Capricorn, but and you're also going to have the the Pluto uh, and uh, it's going to be a Pluto Uranus T square, I believe, in 2014. Uh, Pluto gets to 11, Uranus gets to 11 again, and it's going to be squaring your Venus. That will be a time of test in your relationship, and that will be the first part of 20 um, 2014. So you're going to have to in 2014. You're going to have to figure out kind of you, what you want to keep in terms of your own uh, personal direction as it relates to where you want to go versus uh, the mandates and the matrix and the blueprint, blueprint of the relationship. The relationship will have to undergo some kind of change at that time if you want to be able to continue to explore and push your boundaries and to expand your identity. Uh, the relationship will have to accommodate that. So there we go. Fantastic. Fantastic. Good. Well, I Good. appreciate all that. Okay. Any questions or anything else? No, I think I, uh, I think I got it, and I got some feedback from the room here too. Okay. <laughs> great. Right. Well, well, thanks for calling in, Don, and, and stay sane. Okay. I will. Thanks. Have a great day. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Don in New York. Let's go to the six one six line. Hello there. Yes. Hi. 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 Thanks for taking my call. Um, sure. I'm just wondering if you could read my chart, too. Sure. What's your name? My name's Joan. Oh, Joan. Hi, Joan. Hi. Where are you calling from? From Michigan, southwest lower Michigan. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and give me your birth date? Okay. It's June 24th, 1956. Another monkey. And the time was 7.13 p.m. Monkey day. Uh, uh, 7.13 p.m.? Yes. Okay. All right. And where was that? In Michigan, Holland, Michigan. Holland? Yes. There it is. There's a lot of Hollands here in this country. Um, okay. So there, there you are. There's your chart. Okay. Um, all right. So what would you like to explore or uh, look into or get into? Uh, just anything. I've never had a, a chart reading. i just oh. wondering what pops you, out or, or you how it works. Do you know much about your chart at all? Pardon? Do you know much about your chart at all? No, I don't. Well, let's start with some basics. Okay. You are, okay, so we, you know you're a cancer, right? That's pretty yeah. easy to yeah. figure out. You're an early cancer, three degrees. So, you you know, you're just born just a few days after the sun went into cancer, uh, okay. two days actually. And, um, and let's see here. Uh, uh, do, 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 do. Um, ba, 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 ba. Where are we? Uh, you're Sagittarius rising, and and uh, 18 degrees Sagittarius, and you have a moon in Capricorn, and that moon is at 22 degrees. So you don't have a sun moon opposition like the baby royal has, but you have the mm -hmm. uh, sun moon in the opposite signs, although they're not opposed. So those are the three main uh, components of the chart. The moon represents emotion, how we deal with emotion, what we need emotionally, uh, what we look for in another person to fulfill us emotionally or resonate with us emotionally. The rising sign is how we appear to the world. And it's, it's how we, uh, it's like a filter and how we interact with the world. And as we get older, we tend to become more of our rising sign. 
And then the sun sign, of course, is, is the core of who you are. Okay, so that's how those three things work, right? Okay, okay. Interesting. Okay. So let's start with just Sagittarius rising. I'll do your I'll do your rising sign, your your moon and your sun. So okay. Sagittarius rising. Uh, so the the rising sign, as I see it, is how as, as children we cope with uh, the world, right? So when when we're young and small, we have to develop survival strategies because the world is big it can be scary it can be fun it can be a lot of different things but it's much bigger than we are and the rising sign oftentimes determines how we will as children and then grow through the rest of our lives um, the ascendant to deal with the world and the complexity of it and generally speaking Sagittarius on the ascendant is a child or an individual who was raised uh, in an area um, or a home that generally has a sense of openness, and uh, and there of all the all the ascendants, Sagittarius rising has the most trust. It has the most faith, and it's either because uh, the individual grew up in an environment where trust and faith was fostered, either through a religious context um, or a close connection to nature, or somebody in the family imbued an optimistic spirit, which allowed the child to take on that optimistic spirit. So Sagittarius rising is about adventure. It's about optimism. It's about positivity. It's about you know moving through the world as the world is something to be explored uh, and enjoyed. Uh, it's also uh, Sagittarius is also right, especially on the ascendant is also very uh, much associated with wisdom and that every experience in life is something to learn from, to grow from. You know, that's, that's the, the, uh, the motivation of Sagittarius on the Ascendant. Anytime you can go out and be in nature, uh, anytime you can go out and experience the diversity of another culture or a different country, you, you, you get to expand. You get to fill mm-hmm. out. You get to feel as though there is more of who, more of who you are in a in a in a bigger and a grander sense. Because Sagittarius okay. ascendant, the individual must expand. They must have a feeling of expansiveness. And the more expansive you feel, um, the better you feel. The more you can breathe. So okay. that's part of uh, Sag rising. Uh, it's, it can be very positive, very optimistic. A lot of times, people that are Sagittarius rising, people say they're lucky, like, you know, lucky things or good things happen to you. And it's not because you're born lucky. It's because with Sagittarius on the ascendant, there is a cultivation of positivity that takes place, you know, that there's an openness with people. And they sense that, like, oh, yeah, let me buy you a drink or, oh, would you like to stay at our house while we're away for two weeks? You know, things like that. Uh, The other thing with Sagittarius rising is money is interesting. People that have Sag rising, they will have money come into their lives and then it will go. Money comes in and it goes. And it can be a little frustrating, but they always have enough. So, you you know, you will always have enough with Sag rising. And your true note is in Sagittarius, and it's in the 12th house. So part of your, again, I was talking about the true note with um, the last call or dawn, and it's like that's the beacon. It's the North Star, and you want to follow that. And for you that's in the 12th house, and for you, it's going into um, sort of contemplative, religious, um, peaceful states of being. Your your path is not of this world, really. Your path is something different. You're here to uh, penetrate and enfold yourself in the mystery of creation um, and religion to a certain extent, but not dogmatized religion. Sagittarius yeah, yeah. can be very dogmatic, but it also pushes against dogmatic religions. But there is a religious and philosophical component to that um, uh, true node in the 12th house. Anytime you can get away and go on retreat somewhere, um, that, that those times in your life will be highlighted. You know, to go to, go to some place, like, a, oh, I don't know, I'm just throwing this out there, um, to go to like an abbey, an old abbey in Ireland or Scotland, even if you're not going there to be on a retreat, to go there, to check it out, to walk around the ruins, 
it would spark in you some other kinds of feelings and thoughts about a, being a different person in a different place in a different time. So retreat, any kind of retreat like that, highly, highly, highly recommend it. Uh-huh. Now, okay. You, okay. you have moon in Capricorn, and it's part of what we call a T-square. I'm not really going to give into the T-square too much because it's, it's, it's a little more complicated. But when we look at moon in Capricorn, and, and as I've seen it as an astrologer uh, over the years, people that have moon in Capricorn are born into families where they are taxed with an, early, uh, an amount of responsibility early on. And that could be anything from being the oldest child, taking care of a bunch of younger kids, um, to um, having uh, one of the parents, generally the mother, uh, place a great deal of emphasis around success and achievement. And I've seen this in a number of charts where love at times can be withheld, especially from the mother, unless um, the person does certain things or achieves certain things. So it's like if you get good grades, you'll get rewarded, but you won't get anything close to being rewarded until you you get those good grades. Or it may not even be good grades. It could be more along the lines of um, looking or acting a certain way. Like you'd have to look and act like a fine, prim young woman, and anything outside of that uh, is not acceptable and will not will not be rewarded because there could be a lot of projection from the mother onto the daughter or onto the sun uh, with moon and Capricorn. There's some unfulfilled ambition, generally speaking, that is projected onto the child. So there's a lot of karma, we would call karma, with the mother with the moon and Capricorn. Now, in your chart, it squares Neptune and it opposes Uranus. The Uranus-moon opposition, again, can often at uh, times represent a, um, a split between the mother that could happen very quickly. Um, either through death at an early age or uh, a divorce. And as a result, in your life, you would, be, you would wind up kind of going through situations or experiences where you're trying to find um, a mother-type figure either outside of yourself or even within, you know, the mother within. Who am I as a mother? How do I mother? You know, how, you know, how, how do I do this in, in a way that is different than what I experienced? Because that's what the moon opposition Uranus trying Neptune uh, in in kind of a very limited uh, description uh, is about. So we go to your sun. You have sun in Cancer, nice warm early degree sun in Cancer. It is tied to Venus. Venus is in Gemini uh, in your chart. It's at the end of Gemini, and it's at the 29th degree, which would mean a lots of beginnings and endings in relationship. That you would have one relationship in your life that would be a very important relationship and a very loving relationship. Venus Sun in uh, the seventh house uh, really uh, is is like a I don't know a um, it's like an anchor for you in your life. Relationships are very very important. One relationship in particular very important. Uh, Neptune trining Venus uh, and trining the Sun gives you an immense capacity for compassion. Uh, forgiveness. You're the type of person that if you were in a relationship with somebody and they fucked up, um, you would probably let them know about it with that moon in Capricorn, but ultimately you'd be able to forgive as well. You have a great deal of, of uh, kindness um, associated with your chart with that Neptune-Venus uh, trine uh, and the Neptune-Sun trine. So those are just some some basic and uh, you know kind of fundamental Reads, there's more. You've got Mercury and Gemini, very smart. You've got a Jupiter and Pluto conjunction uh, in the eighth house. Uh, you can make a lot of money for somebody else, and hopefully they, they would include you <laughs> on the money side of things. And you also have a Mars uh, sun trine, which gives you a great deal of uh, vitality and some artistic ability as well, since it's in Pisces. So okay. there we go. Oh, interesting. Oh, interesting. interesting. I, I appreciate it. Okay. I've been That's trying great. to write things down here, so I, I hope I have everything. But um, th- I thank you. Okay, and you can you can always uh, listen back to the show, and because okay. um, an archive, and if there's anything that you did not uh, jot down, you, you can find it on the archive of the show. Okay. Okay. Good. I'll have to do that then. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye, John. I appreciate. It. Thank you. Okay. Bye now. All right, let's take another call here. Let's go to the 208. Here we go. Hello there. Hey, Robert. 
I'm going to perpetrate your moon and Capricorn um, talkings and uh, monkey spree you're on today. This is the gardener. You know what's great about having you on the show? Huh? What? I, I, can, I can put you on, and I can sit back, and I can drink some coffee, and I can listen for a while instead of talk, and I like that. <laughs> Well, I, I've been buzzing with, um, I don't know if you ever go see Anger Fan site. Yes. Oh, yeah. she's They've been just going nuts with all kinds of cryptic, weird, interesting um, things about the baby. Yeah, give us, give us, some, uh, give us some reportage. What's, what else is going on out there? Um. Well, with with talking about your your assessments of children born with Moon and Capricorn, and my you know experience is totally right on with my son having Moon and Capricorn. And with my son, not only is his son exactly on my North Node, like exactly, but his Moon and Cap, 28 Capricorn, same as the New Little Princes, is um, ex, was exactly opposite my Uranus and Cancer at 28 degrees. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I saw that, it really, you know, uh, worried me um, uh, with my son, uh-huh. and my, my relationship. So, do you have you seen that very commonly? No, I have not. Yeah, but they they were both, you know, the conjunction of his son and my North Node in my six, and um, the opposition between his Moon and my Uranus, that, that, those were two really, you know, uh, prominent aspects I saw with mm-hmm. this chart when he was still a baby. Right. Hmm. Well, how's that working out now? Well, it's, it, your assessment of, uh, children born with a moon in Capricorn was pretty right on it. You know, it's not, I'm not happy to say that. Um, yeah. I was very, um, uh, well, pretty much with what you said. Yeah. And um, as an only child, you know, and his stepfather uh, drama at puberty and all of my um, trials and tribulations fighting the man in about six different um, systems, yeah, he had a very um, detached mother. Uh Uh-huh. But he was also very kind of aloof for being a Sag, he was also, he has his Venus in Scorpio with Saturn on it right now. Yeah. And yeah. Um, he had the uh, Uranus-Neptune conjunction in um, Capricorn with uh-huh. his moon on top of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, um, people that have that, the, you know, any type of Capricorn chart are tasked with... A, understanding responsibility and um and power to to a large extent and where responsibility and power uh, either converge or diverge and um it's a, you, obviously with capricorn it's a lifelong mission uh because that's the that's the energy uh, around capricorn so it's something that both the two of you will be engaged in throughout the course of your life together well, with my yeah, with my son too. Now, I was really um, I posted on the chat Dr. Turi's chart, and he used mm-hmm. tropical uh, placement, and it came up with a zero zero. He did it, you know, every house has got the zero zero degree, but right. he's come up with a Cancer rising, and that resonated more with me at, to a royal birth. That that chart with um, the stellium in the eighth. I, I saw that as like a despot's chart myself. A despot's chart. Yes. Doctor Tui. Have you ever heard? Have uh, you ever heard no, of, the. Have you ever heard of no, the. Oh, I'm sorry. What? Have you ever heard me do my Lewis story? Uh. Uh-uh. Do you want to hear it? Sure. Let me see. Let me see. I've got. I have to. I have to get into Louis. You see <laughs> the dragon's head. The dragon All right. is here, and then you have yeah. the dragon's tail over here, you see? <laughs> and when the dragon's head and the dragon's tail oppose, oh, you have war. 
you have conflicts, right? Right? Am I right? <laughs> George, am I right? Yes, Louis. <laughs> you're right. Yes, you're right. Because like <laughs> of George course. Murray. I'll be George Murray, <laughs> Louis Tory. Nori and Tory. <laughs> yes, Louis. Wow, you're right. You're absolutely right about that. Of course, George, I'm right. <laughs> of course I am. I am Louis Adamus. Incarnate. I'm a doctor. <laughs> uh, Louis, 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 I, Louis gave me a great reading a long time ago in San Francisco at the Whole Life Expo. I had a booth, and my booth was next to his. Mm-hmm. And I was doing tarot card readings, and he was doing his dragon's head stuff. And Louis really looked apart, by the way, at that time. Still does. Anyway, uh, his wife was absolutely drop dead gorgeous. I had I had I had to like maintain a different plane of vision when I was sitting next to that that uh, the booth. Anyway, um, they since they they split up though. Anyway, he gave me a reading and uh, it was very very good actually. And one of the things he, he told me that made a great deal of sense for me in my life at that time was um, I was trying to be a vegetarian and I. Uh-huh. I I worked quite hard at being a vegetarian for about three or four months. And I was just freaking cold all the time. I was cold. I was listless. Um, I, you know, I was very passive in a lot of ways. Why? And, and, and he looked at my chart and he says, oh, you need Mars. You need Mars. You must eat meat. And I'm like, really? Yes. You must eat meat. And that day I went out and I had... A cheeseburger. Raw chicken livers. No, I had a cheeseburger. I had a cheeseburger with organic, organic hamburger. It was a killer cheeseburger, and I haven't looked back since. So I, I will thank Louis Turi for getting me out of my vegetarian coma. I have, I'm an O blood type. I can't, I can't deal with being a vegetarian. Well, I'm an A, and and vegetarianism comes pretty naturally to me, but. Um, I was one for about seven years, and what I noticed, it got me so passive, it's like I couldn't even merge in traffic. Uh-huh. You know, I noticed that. I, could, I couldn't even, like, compete enough to drive. Yeah. And when I noticed that, I couldn't merge, you know, um, I, that I quit it. Yeah. It's, uh, and I was throughout my pregnancy, and my child, I raised him um, – very uh, antiquely, where, you know, until he got his meat teeth, he didn't have meat. Mm-hmm. And he had a very, very primo superior vegetarian diet. Um, and his body and health has been absolutely wonderful. But, um, yeah, it's almost like I, I did work my child as a specimen and very dependent on... Um, our bloodlines and et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And he is very, very psychic. And I do think he is at the last of the Pluto and Scorpio bunch. Mm-hmm. And he is very psychic and very strong. Mm-hmm. And um, nobody's fool. And right. also very, very sensitive and delicate, you know, as he's twirling swords. Mm-hmm. So um, <laughs> I think everybody chooses their, their mother's. And um, for for reasons unknown to all of us, but yeah, that this little n- new baby. Now, several people said, "Does that baby look like a newborn to you, or does that look, you know, more experienced moms and grandmothers, or does that look like a three-week-old baby?" And yeah, um, yeah it looks a little older, older to me. Yeah, it looked like quite a, and she just wasn't carrying. Now that she conveniently dropped out of sight for the last six weeks. But her little load didn't look like she was going to produce an eight-and-a-half-pound baby to me. No, not at all. And did you see that baby and, was flashing gang signs? Did you see that? No. I, I saw the update, you know, close up on his little hands, but I didn't pay yeah, attention he was, to he was, it. He was, flash, he was flashing gang signs. <laughs> with his eyes closed. Cool. Well, yeah. one thing I noticed with Kate, um, the way she was holding the baby was emphasizing her left hand, which is, you know, Diana's big, huge sapphire ring on it. Uh-huh. And they even had a close-up of that. So that's the first time I'd seen her wedding band 
um, you know, behind it. And those rings were loose. Yeah. I don't think I wore rings for about the first year yeah, after having a baby. I'm pretty convinced she didn't. And, I, and I, I, I dropped the weight amazingly fast. Yeah. I, I didn't ha- I don't remember having a pronounced little uh, belly like that. Yeah. It's a whole there. It's like Jello. It's it's a whole different uh, mass. Yeah, I don't um, think she. I I, th- I think she had a surrogate. That's what I think. Well, and anger fans really interesting for people that like um, gossip that or uh, speculation or documented truth that goes uh, ten steps beyond bringing up that nurse and her mm-hmm. suicide. So then, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. My theory on that was that there was something to do with twins and that they had removed surgically removed one of the twins and she saw it. Who know, Who knows? You know. Well, she I knows think she that was on. You. On your Facebook, where you were, you brought that one up, and then um, I had just gone through a great big, huge genealogy study on the the Romanovs of the Tsar of Russia, mm-hmm. and all their related, uh, you know, European intermarriages and things. And I, when you said that about the twins, there, you know, who the oldest twin would be the first in line. Um, I, it made me realize I hadn't run across any twins at all in about That's ten right. different family lines. They don't. They don't have twins. If they do, they 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 separate them out somehow, or they they figure it out. They hide the fact. Hey, Gardner. Yes. I'm going to move along because somebody wants a reading. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, thank Good you for deal. calling. Are, 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 sure. you, are you are you enjoying your life? Are you okay? No, I'm not, but. I will be. I think it's just today. We are in time. Hang, hang in there. I am. Thank you. Yeah, go have an ice cream soda. Okay. <laughs> bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Ice cream sodas can make things right. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you're just going to distract yourself. You're just going to have a, a distraction or an addiction. You try it. Next time you're down... Go have an ice cream soda. You will not be so down after you have that ice cream soda. Hi there. Hello? Hello? Hi, it's Camille. Who is it? Camille. Hey, what's going on, Camille? Okay, so, out of the blue, one of my friends texted me yesterday to say, I am coming, driving from work to see you and stay with you guys, I guess, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, what is it looking like in my chart about this? Like, what energies are flowing? Wow. I'm kind of trepidating because I, well, I don't have a lot of company, <laughs> like, ever. <laughs> like, how do I navigate this? Is this a, a male somebody? Oh, no, 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 no. It's one of my girlfriends. And your girlfriend. Oh, and she wants to stay with you for a while. Well, just for like, uh, you know, Friday through Sunday, partially to um, treat me for my belated birthday now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would, so like, without, even, the... without even looking at your chart, I'd say that's a thumbs up. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I would, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, I, I, yeah, so, so, it's, it sounds absolutely fine to me. Yeah. Um, if you look at, uh, when's your birthday again? July 13th, 1976, Los right. Angeles, 6, 18 p.m. So just quickly, wondering what energy is there. Let me just quickly look at the ephemeris. Yeah. July 13th, 76. Um, okay. June, July. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so we're uh, right, right at the, we are, um, we're in Leo now. Mm-hmm. And we're early, early Sun Leo. So um, right now, the sun, the sun conjunct your Saturn, which is nice. Uh, Sun-Saturn conjunction. 
um, it, it'll be good for you. It'll lighten you up. It'll be playful. Okay. Very, yeah, very playful. And, oh, look at that. Uh, you've got Mars in uh, in Virgo at three degrees, so you're going to have a Venus-Mars conjunction. If you go out, there's a very strong possibility you could meet somebody. How about that? Now that would be nice. Yeah. So go out. Go out. Have some fun. Lighten up your Saturn a little bit. You know, bring a little Venus into your Mars and uh, spin the wheel and see where it takes you. All right. Yep. That's my okay. that is my my advice to you. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Well, go ahead and have you, you, don't don't worry, don't fret. You know, it's not going to be um, you know crazy. You know. Yeah. Unhinged, detached, un- unhinged, crazy situation. What was that movie <laughs> with, uh, with Bridget Fonda and uh, what was her name? Uh, um, Barbara or something. No, 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 not Jane Fonda, Bridget Fonda, her niece. Oh, oh, oh. Where they have the crazy oh. sing, single white female. Oh, yeah, female. single white female. Yeah, this will not be a single white female situation. Oh, good, good. Because I'm just like, wait, you're staying with me? I never have people stay with me. And, oh, boy, it's, I kind of, I'm one of those people, oh, the door is ringing. Why is it ringing? What's going on? It's It's very, very ultra rare for me to have, you know, something good show up at the door and linger for a minute. <laughs> no, it'll be it'll be good for you. You guys will have some fun. Okay, good. Thanks. Go see an A's game this weekend. Go see him play the Angels. Oh, say again? Go see the A's play this weekend. Oh, that might be nice. Yeah, that might be play. nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Okay. Oh, check it out. Cool. This, this weekend, they, it's like throwback weekend, like 1970s weekend. So you get like oh. a 19... 19- 70 shirt. Very cool. Oh, wow, sir. All right. Just, well, that's something to think about. All right. Get, get some cool. bleachers. They're cheap. Okay. <laughs> That'll be awesome. Right, Thanks. Camille. Thank you for calling okay. in. Bye-bye. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye. All right. That's our friend, Camille. Calling us from the Five and Dime. Now, speaking of births, uh, Camille had one of the most unusual births and that she had an unexpected birth. She didn't even know she was carrying a child. This is documented on my radio show. She was pregnant, and she didn't even know it. She went out for a bike ride, came back, lay down in the bathtub, and guess what? A few hours later, she's having a baby. How crazy is that? That was a real baby. It is uh, 123 here in Central Texas, deep in the heart of Central Texas. Sangriel in the chat room thought I was doing Arnold Schwarzenegger when I was doing Louis Turry. I was not. Arnold is much more like this. Yeah, you are a Virgo rising. Virgo is about purity. It is about the strength of the blood. Let's go to another caller. I'll be back. Hello there. Hello? Oh, hey, hey. Oh, I know who that is. She's just listening. That was our dear friend, Sandra Wells. I'm back. All right. I don't know how much more I have to say today. I've been on the uh, radio here for 90 minutes. So unless anybody else wants to call in and get a reading, I think I'm going to wind her on down. Uh, I'm going to have Neil Kramer and Montak Chia on the show on Friday. Talk about star-studded. Neil Kramer in Montauk Chia. Neil, of course, is the author of The Unfolding in Montauk Chia, the author of a number of books about energy, sacred energy. A lot of it has to do with the male energy. And we're going to get into the uh, the sacred masculine with Montauk Chia. I'll be recording that interview. He'll be 
talking to me from Thailand, and you know Kramer will be talking to me from Portland, Oregon. And this is the wonder and the magic of the internet and the global brain that we're hooked into for all of its warts and um, pustules and tentacles. It does have some redeeming qualities, doesn't it? All right. So I think that's it. Unless anybody else has anything else to say. I believe this session of Navigating the Astrological Matrix is adjourned. Until then, use your head to discern what's real and your heart to stay open to what's possible. Hasta la vista, baby. We are living in a computer program reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present, deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off 